Hello again, this is Mr. Montgomery. It is a Thursday afternoon uh, here in Laverne. I have done my yard work for the day, cut the back lawn and trimmed the lawn. I have uh, done a couple of exercises for my other courses and now I wanted to record at least a couple of more chapter uh, video lectures for you today. And the first one we're going to, I'm going to do is on chapter seven gathering materials. Now, you and I have done research for many years. Remember back in elementary school, probably fifth grade, where you would be given a topic, an animal speech or something, and you would have to go find research. Usually at that time it was one book, there was no internet, at least when I was a kid, there were no computers or anything like that. We weren't even calculators. Uh, but you would usually get one encyclopedia, find the article on vultures, and then grab the material out of there and basically rehash the same material from the text uh, and present it in a paper. That's research. Well, we're going to go far beyond that in this speech. And you want to acknowledge the fact, it'll make life easier for you, if you recognize and accept the fact that your informative speech and your persuasive speech are both uh, research-based assignments. In other words, it's good that you're going to include you, what you know and your experiences like that, but certainly not enough. So you're going to do research through magazine articles, through journals, through books, through videos, etc., and you're going to represent those in your speech. And they're going to be represented in three ways. First of all, the fact that you are going to be knowledgeable about your topic is going to say that you, it's going to come across that you've prepared for the speech by doing research. Now, the second way it's going to show up is through your inline or in-text citations, where you are going to either through a quote or paraphrase identify information that came from another source, a qualified source, that, uh, and you're going to say who said it, where they said it, when they said it, and what they said. And we've talked about that before. So those are going to be included. In your informative speech, you're going to give us five of those. In your persuasive speech, six. In the body, in the introduction, as well as in the conclusion. They can be throughout that speech. But that's going to help back up and strengthen uh, your presentation. Then the third place that they're going to show up is in your uh, research page, or excuse me, references page. We do, same thing as a bibliography, a little bit different, but we don't call it a bibliography. We call it a references page. So don't call it a bibliography. Don't call it a works cited. It's a references page. Uh, you're going to do that in MLA format, which a couple of things where people usually go sideways on it. First of all, uh, you're going to do everything double spaced, double spaced only. There is no extra spacing between your different entries. And then second, use... Uh, um, hanging indents. That is, the first line is all the way left justified, and then the second line is indented, and then the next entry, left justify, and then the extra lines are indented. So anyway, follow that format by name and then by um, double spacing and left uh, your hanging indents for your references. And in your informative speech, you have to have six references. And in your persuasive speech, you have to have uh, eight speech, eight references. So eight. So anyway, so make sure you're on the right track with that. Lots of information to back up your uh, presentation that provides credibility and confidence in you as a speaker. So what I wanna do in this chapter seven is give you go through over the proper methods for doing adequate and quality research. And so first of all, they say, use your own knowledge and experiences. If you are doing a speech on downhill snow skiing and you are a uh, avid downhill snow skier, you probably want to include your um, Experiences in that presentation. Tell us about the experiences you've had. Include them in there constantly so that'd be good. 
And then also your knowledge. If you have background knowledge on the, inf on the first hand knowledge, include that as well. Now, but the important part here is, and sometimes this is what happens, don't stop there. You are probably not an expert, an acknowledged and recognized expert in the field of your presentation. Maybe you are, and that's great. But you can't stop with you because, again, credibility is not that you don't know what you're talking about, not that you haven't experienced that, but your credibility is limited and that your audience may not know that you are an expert and you're telling them about this information about downhill snow skiing, but they don't know you, whether you really know what you're talking about or not in your, on your own. That's why we use those inline in-text citations. Uh, another warning is that you, if you speak to the same group of people regularly, don't wear out your audience by talking constantly about downhill snow skiing, that you bring it up all the time. For example, for me as a type one diabetic, since I was 17, I'm 60 now. What is that, 43 years? Yeah, I think that's about right. <laughs> my math is not my thing. Uh, I can't, I don't, I can't, if, if I'm speaking to the same group every week, if I keep bringing up type one diabetes, my last uh, church, I was there for 23 years. Can you imagine every week for 23 years, I brought up the same items about type one diabetes? I can't do that. So I would use them sparingly here and there every few years apart because I didn't want to bore people with my stories. So just be aware of that. That's not a common thing, but you got what, just want to be aware of that. Okay. The second place you can go is to obviously library research. Now, to be honest, most people do not visit libraries. I often ask my classes, how many people uh, know where the library is? And usually they can tell me that. How many have been in the library? And many will raise their hand. But when I ask the question, how many have gone to the uh, library to do research and not simply to use it as a place to study, uh, a lot of the hands drop. People just don't use the library. And it makes sense with the online uh, resources available today. That wasn't when I was growing up, I didn't have that. But today you've got all that material, so why not take advantage of it? But however, there is one, even if you never go to the physical library, use the reference librarian as a source, a, a resource to help you if you're stuck on doing research on your topic. It's a live person that can help you uh, with that. Uh, they also mentioned using newspapers. Now, I do not know if uh, how many folks get a newspaper or read a newspaper. We don't, especially not the physical printed one that's thrown on your porch, that business is in the tank, and you can go online and do read newspapers, but many people just don't. They find their news in other places. Many people find their news on Instagram or Facebook, and I'm not sure how confident I would have in doing that, but, you know, you whatever. I, I watch um, news on television quite a bit, so I try to keep up on what's going on, and but I think, I think that probably has more credibility than uh, Facebook or Instagram. I could be wrong on that. Uh, third is use databases. And I am pretty sure all of you have used a database uh, where you will go online and type in your topic in a, in a school database usually, and it will give come back with multiple articles on your topic. So that's a great way uh, to do that. The next thing though, we need to then be able to decide how to evaluate all those articles that are in front of us. Are, are they all equal? Are they all fair games? Can I use any of them without hesitation? And the answer is no. Some articles have more uh, credibility than others. And so you have to have some kind of criteria to gauge the articles on. And the first one I want to mention is just if you're looking at articles from magazines, uh, Scientific American, for example, probably has more credibility than People Magazine. Maybe credibility is not the right word, maybe depth or significance or uh, power of persuasion. That if you tell me you got something from People Magazine, I might go, eh, who cares? But if you say Scientific American, National Geographic, I'm a little bit more willing to pay attention to an article from those because they have a reputation of being quality 
reference sources. So consider that. Another element we want to mention is the question of Wikipedia. Wikipedia has done a great job and gotten much better over the uh, years of becoming more credible. Early days, it was just somebody posted this and has it been checked? Has it been confirmed? Is it reliable information? And it wasn't as clear. Today, it's getting more and more reliable. I still don't want you to, in your speech, say, according to the Wikipedia article on Scottish kilts, I think it'd be a great speech. Nobody's ever done one on kilts. I'm a, I have some Scottish background, and that'd be interesting to find out, but nobody has done the work for me yet. But one way you can use Wikipedia, which I great, think is a great source, whenever I would come up with a topic I hadn't spoken on, I would go to Wikipedia, and I would read the article just to give me a refresher or a, a quick lesson on the topic. But then for my own research, I would then go to the uh, references listed in Wikipedia and see if there were any references I could use for my speech, which would probably have a higher level of credibility. So there is a way to use Wikipedia beyond just referencing the article. But don't quote or refer to Wikipedia articles. Find something with a little more, uh, what we might say, significance or gravitas. Something that has a little bit more weight to it in the research realm. Okay, so also when evaluating articles, they give about three suggestions in the textbook. First of all, check out the author. Is the author somebody people are going to know offhand? Or is the author of questionable uh, character themselves? So when they hear that author's name, there's going to be a negative reaction to the author. So it just doesn't mean you can't use them. It just means you need to take that into account. They also mention sponsorship. Is there a group, an organization that is uh, uh, supporting the article or behind the article or on their website? And again, same thing. If that group has strong credibility, great. But if they have questionable uh, background or credibility, you've got to take that into account when you're using their material. Because even if the material in the article is good, people are still going to attach it to the uh, sponsor of the article, and that may you may lose some credibility that way. And then the third question they suggest to consider is recency. Is this an up-to-date article or a very old article? Now, up-to-date, especially in the realms, I think, of science and technology, you got to have some up-to-date material because it became, can become so dated so quickly. So keep up-to-date on the material you're going to present. Other topics, older articles may make no difference at all. But anyway, at least consider the date of the article. Now, let me mention a method that hardly anyone uses in speech. I've heard, you know, thousands of speeches and hardly anyone ever does an interview. And it is a, I think, a greatly overlooked great resource to have. If you're going to do a speech on uh, electric cars, why not call a local dealership, talk to the manager and gather some information about electric cars. What's selling, what's not selling, what are some numbers in terms of how many sold last year, how many have sold this year, has the coronavirus affected sales, how many do you project to sell next year for those trends? You see how that would be great information? And so I would encourage you to do one. You can just do it over the phone. But they, they give you three time frames to consider when, going, when you're going to do an interview. Maybe I should give extra credit at some point for that. Not in this one, but, you know, never mind. Uh, first of all, before the interview, and the key element is come up with great questions. Have your questions ready to go when you're, uh, before you make that phone call to do the interview. That doesn't mean you may not come up with some more uh, questions while you're doing the interview, but have a great list ready to go, that they're good questions, they're specific questions. They uh, don't just ask yes or no questions, ask leading questions. So you can gather more information from the uh, person. 
Second, during the interview, and they give you some different suggestions in there. The two big ones that struck out to me were, number one, be a good listener. Use your best listening skills. Don't play music in the background. Don't have anybody else in the room. Your full listening strength directed into that phone call. Uh, and then also the other one is take really good notes. If you're not clear about something, ask, get it clarified while you're on the phone with them. Make sure you have all the information. Make sure your the dates are correct. Make sure the if they mention a person's name, <coughs> make sure that you get that name correct as well. And then finally, third point is after the interview. Go through your notes rather quickly after the interview and make sure you have any all the information correct. Uh, maybe you miss something and then when you review it, you go, oh yeah, I need to clarify that. Or make a list of notes. If there's something you missed or a date or something, it's okay to call the interviewee back and ask the question, but don't do it just because you were lazy in your uh, note taking or your listening while you were doing the interview. And then here's my personal suggestion. Send that person a thank you note on paper with an envelope, stamp, send it through the United States Postal Service. Uh, don't send an email, don't send a text message. In my opinion, those are good for, hey, I'll see you at the movies or whatever in December, but don't do that with something like it. You want something a little bit more uh, personal. I was gonna use the word classy, but I don't really mean that. I mean personal. That's something that takes a little more effort than just shooting off an email. So anyway, interviews are great and underused. <clears throat> Okay, some, some tips for doing your research. Number one, start early. Don't wait too long. That's the same thing with everything in these speeches. The sooner you start, uh, the sooner you can get going on it and you can do a better job. That's why in, I think, next week's you know overview of here's what we're doing next week, when that's posted on Sunday night, I'm going to talk a little bit about your upcoming informative speech, which isn't for several weeks yet, but I just want to give you a heads up so you can begin thinking and thinking and thinking so you, that you're ahead of the game. So start early on doing that research. Second, they mentioned make a preliminary bibliography. I've never done that in my life. I, uh, you know, go for it. If that's something that is helpful to you, I can't speak from experience on that. Number three, take notes effectively. Now, I am a great note taker. I take notes wherever I go. Whenever I hear someone speak, I take notes partially because I want to learn and remember, but also because I might use some of that material or those references in my own speaking engagements at some point. So I steal everything I can. And just so you know, I steal everything from speakers so that you have an arsenal built up uh, for yourself. I had three filing cap, literal physical filing cabinets in my office full of illustrations and examples and stories that I had collected over the years. So if I was going to do a speech on a topic, I could just go to my file, literally, physically, not just online, and find that file, pull it out, and I would have five or seven articles ready to go that I could use for my presentation. So if you're going to be doing public speaking in your future, you want to do something like that. Start gathering materials uh, now. And taking good notes is one of the ways you can do that. It, uh, and the, part of that also is making sure you get all the information the first time. Who wrote the article, when they wrote it, where you got it, etc., etc. One of the things I think that is, is disheartening to me and heartbreaking is when somebody on the feedback from their speeches, they will tell me to say, yeah, you marked me down because I didn't have the authors or the dates and the reason is I didn't include those is because I didn't get it the first time and I just didn't feel like going back to get it. Well, laziness is the word that comes to mind. Maybe they're too busy to do that, overwhelmed. I get that. But get that information the first time because if there is a tendency to not to want to go back, take notes in a way that you don't have to go back. Get it right the first time. Just a, an encouragement. And then also take plenty of notes. Don't not write something down because it's going to be too short. 
So make sure you get it right the first time. I just lost track because I think somebody was coming to the door. But anyway, get all the information, lots of notes, more than you need. You don't, you can just throw out the ones you don't need, but it's a lot easier to throw something away than it is to have to go back and find it uh, the next time. Okay, then finally, the last thing that this ch chapter touches on are quotations versus uh, paraphrases in your speeches. This is what happens when you record at home. Uh, a quotation is the full item of what a person said. In general, it is better because it, it sounds more authoritative and it's more complete and it's from the, the, the lips of the person who said it, quote unquote. If you paraphrase, that's a summary of what they said, which is good. It's just not as strong or, in my opinion, it is not as uh, impactful. But you still want to give who said it, where they said it, when they said it. You're just now summarizing. And one of the big distinctions is if you're doing a quotation, only a couple of sentences. If it's longer than a couple of sentences, you want to do a paraphrase. However, in my opinion, if it is a strong, powerful statement and the way it was worded is part of its power, don't lose the power of the statement by paraphrasing. Still do the quotation, even if it's a little bit longer than a couple of sentences. But you don't want to go on uh, too long uh, with that. So that's just my opinion, but I think that's important to do. Don't lose the power of words. Because we mentioned that, remember, before, is you want to be intentional and strategic in your word choice. So that would also be conveyed in the uh, quotations that you provide us in your speech. Okay, so that's it on talking about how to do quality research for your presentation and do good research, do lots of research, do adequate research and give us all the information so that you your speech is better and stronger because it is based on research, not just opinion or thoughts or personal experiences or just ideas out there. Give us solid research. Okay, that's it for now.